I don't even see it as a discipline as much as this is my version of Fortnite. This is my <laughs> version of Mario Kart. You know, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. my version of drugs. This is my version of all that kind of stuff right. that seems to persuade people to not do their creativity. I'm fortunate that I've crafted a lifestyle to where that is the addiction. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So. Welcome to this PAL Music interview. Our goal is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you to develop your craft, stay inspired, and design a life where your creativity can thrive. Today, I have the good fortune to be in the home studio of Emmy award-winning musician, composer, and educator, Derek Van Scoten, AKA Cloud Chord. Derek is an equally talented electronic producer and guitar player, and he brings these two skills together to create unique hip hop and neo soul infused soundscapes and his electrifying one man band live shows. His latest release, Koi Pond, has over 3 million streams on Spotify, and Derek has released several full length EPs since 2011. He's played at festivals like Gathering of the Vibes and South by Southwest with groups such as the Boulder Philharmonic, DJ Logic, and Devachka. He has toured with acts like Big Gigantic, Beats Antique, Emancipator, and Lotus, led electronic music workshops at Alex Gray's Chapel of Sacred Mirrors, and he's collaborated on recordings featuring rapper Talib Kweli of Black Star fame. It must also be mentioned that Derek has a degree in classical guitar and has scored entire films, such as In Football We Trust, which was featured at the Sundance Film Festival in 2015. In addition to his prolific recording and performing, Cloud Chord provides daily creative, educational, and thoroughly entertaining content for his Instagram audience, including a daily riff, a daily lesson, collabs with other artists, and perhaps most memorably, duets with his adorable dancing daughter, which I finally got to meet about 20 minutes ago. Derek, thank you nice to see for you. inviting me in here. How are you? I'm great. Doing great today. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Out to the farm. Yeah, when, when I first saw your Instagram videos with like chickens in the background and yeah. chimes, I was like, you live the life. Who is this guy? <laughs> Where is he? Yeah, right, exactly. Totally. So I discovered you on Instagram seeing um, the Pickup Jazz community. I think they might have featured <clears throat> one of your videos. <clears throat> yeah, and they have a few, yeah. You were sitting maybe in this room doing your thing, smile on your face. At one point, your daughter came in, mm -hmm. and then I just went to your page, I explored a little more, I saw that you offered daily content, kind of like a sneak peek inside your creative process, the things that you do, mm -hmm. and it became clear to me, or at least it, it appeared to be so, that you uh, really have like kind of crafted a life for yourself where creativity is a part of your your daily thing, and you just kind of, have this uh, this ongoing daily practice. That's what it, it seems to me. Yeah. And then on top of that, there's this consistent output of creative material, whether it's your albums, um, your touring, just the little blips yeah. that you put out for us sure. on the internet. Sure, sure. So um, what I'm wondering is like, how do you do all this? Like how how does one make this work in their life so this, this, right, is, right. this is a huge question um but yeah i mean I, i'm wondering about like what's your routine how do you organize your life uh how do you balance you're also obviously a father right. and a family person how do you balance all these things so i know that's loaded but sure. i, I kind of want to start right there sure yeah. I think the simple one word answer is, or two word answer is, it's a healthy addiction, you know. Um, but to go more into that, I have an amazing family who gives me an incredible amount of space to do my thing. My wife's also a musician and she's a teacher. She's actually giving a vocal lesson upstairs right now as we speak. But she understands I had the good fortune of marrying an incredible soul who understands if I don't get that daily creativity, then I'm actually not very inspiring to be around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I get a little crabby, I get a little maybe spacey or distant. I, I own all that stuff. But I think for me, it's, um, there's nothing I'd rather be, be doing, you know, there's a Frank Zappa quote up. He said, 
do I miss that I didn't skydive or go mountain climbing or go scuba diving? And the answer was, yeah, all that looks cool, but no, I don't regret the fact that I made this choice of staying in the studio versus all that other cool stuff that is enticing. And I feel the same way. Um, you know, I, it's very probable that throughout the week there may be two and a half or three days where I don't leave the land at all. And mm -hmm. I just kind of hang out in the studio and it is not boring and I'm never um, itching to get out and, you know, much to the chagrin of my friends who would love to see me more often. I, I just love doing this, you know, and I have, I keep on going, I, I think to dig more into like, how do I do this? How do I keep the momentum? Um, I keep lists. That's a really big part of my process is both I keep physical lists. So like, here's a list and it's in three columns and one is Instagram. The other is business and the other is what I'm going to learn this week. Mm. And then there's a side one of mixes that I have to finish. Mm -hmm. And then here on a nice little Halloween pumpkin was uh, just an idea that I had the other day. Like I try to continually jot down my ideas and mm -hmm. stay somewhat organized. Cause you know, a lot of times we'll have all these overflowing ideas. We don't write them down the next day. We're like, yesterday was so awesome. I had all these ideas and today I don't. Mm -hmm. And life kind of sucks now. But if you had had that list, you go, okay, maybe today's a day to an action day instead of an idea day, you know? And so here's a list of uh, like, good example, yesterday afternoon, I thought, how, what are some easy ways for me to continually post videos on Instagram? Uh, and here's like four themes that I can go throughout the week. One is a quick one. How about a 10 to 15 second guitar video? Mm -hmm. Just boom, I don't really do enough of those. I do those on the stories, but I don't actually do videos on my actual timeline. Mm -hmm. um, another one is a cover. I don't do many covers. How about an acoustic rendition of a flume tune or something, you know, a really left field like that. Another is an original. Um, which I do a lot. And then another is uh, just guitar, you mm -hmm. know, without any beats or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then, and then it, like here's um, some like Instagram stories that I have, like the cool story, bro, the one that I have so many stories from being out on the road that it's probably a good idea for me to uh, write those down. You mm -hmm. know, like I have one coming up about us playing a wedding for Chubby Checker's daughter. It's a really <laughs> cool story, That's you know cool. what I mean? Uh, then there's the lick of the day and then a, a playlist that I curate that helps other artists and kind of puts the tentacles out to community and networking. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, I think that's, I think in an encapsulation, there's nothing else I'd be rather doing. It's kind of the only thing I'm good at, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm okay at being a husband and a father and a friend to people and that kind of stuff. Um, but really, this is what I'm best at. And there's no, I don't even see it as a discipline as much mm -hmm. as this is my version of Fortnite. This is my <laughs> version of Mario Kart. You know, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. my version of drugs. This is my version of all that kind of stuff right. that seems to persuade people to not do their creativity. I'm fortunate that I've crafted a lifestyle to where that is the addiction. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So... Right. You just used the word fortunate. You said you're fortunate enough. Um, uh -huh. But we all know no one just said, here, here's the life. You know, you can do this all day. You had to make it possible. Right. You had to figure out, how do I play my version of Fortnite uh, every day? And, for money and make to make a living thing. for Yeah, it. totally. Yeah. So was, was that like a, a choice uh -huh. that you had to make? Or was it always like, this is the only option? And once you made that choice, or once you realized there's no other option, how did you go about um, not having to succumb? Or maybe you did temporarily to the, the kind of quick money path that's presented sure, to everyone. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it wasn't a black and white thing of, you know, hey, I'm 22 and making a living off of music, and I've never looked back since then. It's, it wasn't necessarily that. It was. I did have the fortune of when I went to school uh, in Boulder that uh, one of the things that I was able to do for money was give guitar lessons and mandolin lessons to non-music majors. Mm -hmm. So, and that paid better than pretty much any other just side job that I would have. And in the process, I had four years where I learned how to teach. So by the time I was out, I had four years worth of teaching under my belt and I was able to make some dough 
instead of, you know, working at Papa John's or something on the weekend, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that also kind of bought me time to like really get my ear together. You know, a student came in and they want to learn Dave Matthews and it went from, oh my God, can I do this for them to a couple years down the road? Yeah, like no problem. Just whatever you throw at me, I got you. And within 30 minutes, you're going to be walking out the door with tab on the song, that kind of thing. But it's, you know, after college, I did have some odd jobs here and there um, that were kind of like under the table and stuff like that. And then eventually I was able to just get enough of a, a gigging schedule and student base that it that it worked out. Um, I My career has just kind of manifested into three parts and one is teaching, one is performing, and the other is like composing, composing or licensing. I think the benefit of having that, well, the, the it can attend, uh, occasionally be overwhelming if they're all popping off at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I have two commercials, I have three gigs, and I have 40 students. It's right. like, what am I going to do? But then there's other times where like, okay, I don't have many gigs right now, but I do have a ton of students, and I'm working on these two commercials and releasing this music that's generating royalties. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I pretty much love it all, you know. I mean, even the most stale corporate licensing work you know like i did stuff for nba last christmas and you know i think some composers may have huffed and puffed up that it wasn't cool and left field enough but to me it was kind of neat that i got paid to write a trap jingle for nba you know? right. <laughs> so and it's it's really like a resilience of being able like being willing to work every day you know it's sunday and i don't really see like I, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else than my studio right now, working on music this morning and then hang out with you and then I have a lesson after you and right. that kind of stuff. So does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's that's great. I know a lot of musicians, though, um, kind of are, are able to get to the point where the teaching is sustainable, uh -huh. maybe finding some side gigs for people that are more established, but you've mm -hmm. kind of made the transition to uh making your own music own and leading thing. your own thing mm -hmm. and and uh and that so can you talk about how that transition uh, kind of happened for you yeah because you know when i started this whole thing i did very little solo work i think the extent of my solo work was christmas time playing solo jazz guitar near the checkout at Whole Foods for 150 bucks of a gift certificate, <laughs> you know, which is very different than what I'm doing now, right? You know, those um, people were lucky though, because while we were <laughs> setting up, you played some jazz guitar for us and it made the whole situation better. <laughs> cool, it calmed your nerves. Um, so yeah, it's it. there was never one huge apex or breaking moment that it was like, okay, now it wasn't like I had a hit that just changed everything. You know, I've had success with remixes, and you know, I've done stuff with major labels, and I've met some really cool artists who somehow knew about me that were famous and blah, but there was never any point where it was like, oh wow, okay, I'm making 50 Gs a month off of this, and I can just drop everything else. It was much more of, I'm working with bands, I'm working as a side man, you know, I'm doing lots of work for higher gigs of other people's music. And then I learned Ableton. That was kind of the seed that grew this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I had a residency with my wife in Boulder at the time. We played a four hour set every Sunday night and we'd have guests come. And then I had a Monday night residency with a drummer and we, it was an open mic for hip, uh, for like MCs and singers. And so those were two things that really kind of bu started building my chops to go from a four or five piece ensemble to slowly down to one. And then um, moved to Brooklyn in 2010 and kind of, I guess that's the point where I jumped off the cliff mm -hmm. because I didn't have a ton of bands to work with. Mm. And so I, but I had enough momentum um, as a solo artist from releasing stuff and just kind of being a natural networker that I saw, I was like, okay, there's Boston, there's New York, there's Philly. And in New York, we have Brooklyn versus Manhattan and even mm -hmm. Queens and stuff like that. And then we have Philly 
and then we have DC, and then all these little towns. Baltimore too. Like five years ago, Baltimore had an amazing scene for electronic music. So it was, and it was just really the willingness to kind of continually hustle and and not necessarily lead an extravagant lifestyle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's part of it too, right? You know, um, to where you know I would never hire more people on than I had to, or like I could afford to go play in Boston on a Wednesday night and mm -hmm. then go play in Philly on a Friday night. And, yeah. And it was just me, so it was profitable. Mm -hmm. And so really one foot in front of the other and mm -hmm. just continually working. And I think my main advice to anybody that is dealing with those frustrations is above everything focus on your greatness focus on your skill and your greatness because it's so easy to get frustrated of well i was doing great six months ago and now my numbers are down or so and so is looking to me for advice but somehow they're popping off mm -hmm. you know there's all of these um external factors that could contribute to frustration and kind of internal heat mm -hmm. that kills off the creative process mm. But really, especially over the past several years, I've started focusing on like, how can I be as amazing as possible? What can I do every day mm. to where, if I did get the chance to be sitting in front of Drake or somebody, mm. that, I, that I just be like, cool, here's, here's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And that's just really working on it every day mm -hmm. and checking myself against my idols of like, how am I how am I holding up? How is just my raw, organic material mm -hmm. holding up? Regardless of what I think I deserve or what other people are getting, mm -hmm. what check myself, you know? Yeah. So and it's and it's continually one day at a time. You know, it's like I haven't had a day job in well over a decade, mm -hmm. but I hustle like that could go away next week. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, but there's nothing I'd rather be doing. Again, I keep saying that. But, yeah. 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 That's awesome. So uh, you mentioned you're, you've got the hustle, you're a good networker, um, you're, you can go out and you keep lists, you try to kind of preempt tomorrow and know what's, what's going on, but then um, the creative process is something different than all that. So yes, um, totally I, I guess I've got one question is, is how do you compartmentalize those two things like being cloud court or or derek the business and mm -hmm. and and the creative process so that's mm -hmm. that's kind of one thing and sure. then the other thing is what helps you transition into that totally well there's a couple of things that i do the um i recommend send setting up firewalls around your creative process so mm -hmm. external factors can't impede them so one of the things I rare do is I rarely have my phone in my studio. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost always up in my bedroom. It's it's an addiction, you know, with social media. It's like, oh, who checked it? Did my agent call me? What's happening on the agency Slack? Right. You know, did somebody comment on my video on YouTube? It's like they're... It's so easy to go to your phone for one thing and 45 minutes later, you never got to that. Oh, you yeah. Know? <laughs> I mean, we're all guilty. And then you're like, why did I come here? Right. Yeah. So... A uh, couple things. M my phone is literally on a different floor in the house because I know that yes. I have an addiction. <laughs> Not just behind the wall. Not just behind the wall. The it's floor. like I really <laughs> have to go get it. You right. know? And I have about 50 steps to second guess myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know? right. part of it, that's a really big part of it. Um, I've actually turned off all my notifications on my phone. So mm -hmm. I have to like deliberately go into any app to check it out. So it makes everything much more intentional. Um, and But really it's it's like, the f for me, I know how my mind and my spirit works and I have the most traction in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so if, and my wife is amazing about recognizing that too. So I tend to be an early riser because of that. Mm -hmm. And um, we were talking earlier about like how my bio says you know, a, a roughly 90 minutes of meditation. Really what that is, is that's just complete um, musical focus for that long with no, oh, who emailed me? Do I e need to email them back? It's just like a firewall around anything. Like I'm not checking on how the latest track is doing or anything like that. And then 
you know, around lunchtime or something when I've kind of burnt up all that energy as I can get into business mode. Mm -hmm. So really it's, it takes a lot of discipline to compartmentalize, but once you start doing it, you'll never want to go back. Mm -hmm. You know, and yes, there are things that I've missed because of it. Of like, hey, we need this track. If you run me back 12 minutes, it'll be yours. It'll be $3,000. But those are so few and far between. <laughs> Most people, if they want you, can wait two hours, mm -hmm. you know? So really it's it's that firewall, you mm -hmm. know? And for me, again, it's the morning. More than anything, late night's great too, but uh, the morning with just very little, it's like a thing of mate and just like kind of a clean slate and you know, most of the time I'm just working on something brand new, but occasionally I'm like redoing guitar parts from mm -hmm. an old from a meditation last week. Of, All right, now I'm really gonna dig into this and make it happen. So mm -hmm. like some days are completely create. Like this is a gut thing too. Like mm -hmm. some days, I think I'm I think I might have something brand new out of thin air. And then other days it's like, <clears throat> oh, there was that beat that I made last week, and I think I'm finally in the mood to like really work on those guitars and get the perfect take and the layers you know so mm -hmm. some days are pure creation mode and other days are more like cleanup editing days mm -hmm. and that's listening to your gut mm -hmm. because sometimes you can feel like you're going the wrong way mm -hmm. like a half hour later it's like i haven't come up with anything and my gut told me it was an editing day mm -hmm. you know but i still see that as a meditation because it's it's creativity it's finishing we were talking earlier about like the classic artist story if i have 250 unfinished demos you know and i haven't released a song in two years well it's like well maybe you got a problem <laughs> maybe yeah. you need to focus a little more on the second phase which yeah. is the editing phase mm -hmm. you know and, and clean some of this up so you shared on instagram a few days ago and i thought i screenshotted it and i didn't i, re I replied to it it was like maybe a note from your phone where you were like it was oh, tips right. on creativity or the creative process, but mm -hmm. to me the point was like, no, like um, don't try to fight yourself if you're not feeling something, and instead like right. leverage uh, th the the opportunity to maybe do something like editing or because I know I deal with this when I'm like, all right, I'm in the studio and I came here to create, and like I just. It's like nothing's, nothing's happening. So, and I just get mad at myself, and then sure. I just want to stop. And then that's the downward spiral. Right. Right. Because um, then you're getting heady instead of hearty. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, that uh, my friend Matt Harris from Nashville, who played drums in a band called Zuma, he wrote, "He's like, what keeps you inspired?" And I was hanging out with my daughter, and I just randomly had all these ideas. So I wrote them on a note, and I screenshot and sent it to him. And I was like, "Oh, this is kind of cool. Maybe I'll post it for everybody." And that was the whole thing of there is the balance. Some days, pure creativity, brand new riff. Other days, what we're talking about, you're more in editing mode. Other days, um, which I was gonna show you when we play guitar, is how to do what I call like a silhouette of something else. Mm. So, um, should I grab my guitar? Sure, yeah, yeah, let's, let's do it uh, as an example. <laughs> Okay, so let's say for for argument's sake, <laughs> you think today is a day to come up with something brand new. Right. And you've been there for a while, and all you got is... <laughs> right. Yeah. right. <laughs> so then you say, um, well, I was really wanting to make something funky and soulful. Right. But maybe I just haven't been playing enough of that kind of stuff recently or listening to that stuff to be in that paradigm, that musical paradigm, to have any good ideas. Mm -hmm. So then like, I would say, okay, how about Let's Get It On by Marvin Gaye. Okay. That's like E major seven, or sorry, E flat major seven, to G minor, to F minor, to B flat seven. Obviously that too, right? Uh, that's the riff in the beginning. Uh -huh. All right, so we're not out of the woods yet, though, right? Okay, so yeah, then, yeah. then I would say, okay, let's change the key. Okay. So how about we change it to D? We'll just go down a half step. So then it's D major seven. Yeah. Cool. And then what I'll do is I'll do this really slowly, 
I'll try to bring out a brand new melody that's based on chord tones. Okay. okay? So, like for example, uh, I'll just do the third on the D. So we got the F sharp here. Now let's go up to the third on F sharp. Good. And then uh, you got. It. So we got. And then on the E, let's go up to the, the B. And then on the A7, let's do C sharp. So, uh -huh. And then I maybe do a second phrase that went. Oh, something like okay. that. I would build yeah. a second phrase. But maybe I would do that down an octave. And then I would just keep going on that until maybe I had, you know, like... You know, and then I would load it in here and I put it... Right. You know, and maybe... And it's no longer what's going on. Now it's something new. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And then I would, you know, throw something that on there. So now you're not relying on this, like, vacuum of creativity. You're like, let me just take that, and right. now I'm going to rework that. I've got this clay to work with. I exactly. don't have to, like, mix the clay. It's exactly, there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the thing. The more music you study, the more you have, uh, like the x-ray vision to see where that came from. You know, like nothing, John Schofield said nothing is new and nothing has been new for centuries. Yeah. You know, I mean, we can, with the exception of maybe blues, um, like nothing new has really happened since, you know, Mozart or Bach's area, it, harmonically speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, yeah, I mean, I guess there's like some, some crazy scales for like classical, but like nothing that's accessible that mm -hmm. people actually listen to that aren't musicians. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, but that's the thing too. Like I'll maybe even take like a, like see how far apart you can remove something, you know, mm -hmm. like a classical piece mm. and the melody, mm. you know, and then can I make a funk tune out of this, mm. you know? And so I really recommend people to just like um, beg, borrow, and steal from as much as you can, but mm. then like commit to getting it so far away that nobody would notice. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You uh, posted in your, on your IGTV uh, about, it was, a, it was a breakdown of one of your solos, but you said, I listened to another Instagrammer, like, brownie points if you can let me know what it was. <laughs> right, right. And you did this, this thing, uh, and then right. that was like the basis for that something basis, you did. Right. And I love how transparent you are about that, because it's, it's not, so, it's the reality of making music. That's totally. where, right, totally. so, so what, can you show us how that worked? Or maybe we'll put yeah, the yeah. challenge out again. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, uh, um, if you I remember what that totally, was, I think it was um, it was a like a pentatonic riff that went down. The whole point though was I think the player had it. It was I think like a one six two or four five, like kind of the progression we just did. Yeah, and like my natural. Um, jazz mentality would be to like play the changes you know? right. that kind of stuff when the chord changes so should you but a lot of like there is something about saying okay i'm smart enough to do that and now i'm not going to do that mm -hmm. now i'm going to actually intentionally paint with only one color mm. and all of a sudden all this stuff comes out so it was like thing or maybe it was one, three, something like that. But it was. What did I do? So instead of following the changes, uh -huh. they just kind of blew through the whole scale. Right. And to me, that was one of those things of like, 
thinking too complex too mm-hmm. often. Right. Why don't I think like an intermediate player? Mm-hmm. You know, that doesn't know how to right. do the stuff that I want to do. Just skate on top a little bit. Just skate yeah. on top and not wear like things that kids get yelled at for in mm-hmm. jazz school. I right. now do that. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And that was a new thing. And yeah. then I was like, this is kind of fun. Like yeah. not not paying attention to the courts. Right. So awesome. Cool. Um, one thing you, you talked about was the, uh, the, even though you said that your musical me- meditation could just be uh, whatever it is in the morning, your creative time, where it's not what you're doing for other people necessarily, you're just doing your creative work. But um, I did read that there, there was a specific like meditation of, of like free melody or following. Is, was there like a, a process there or like a like a guided meditation sort of thing that you if you would be able to express it in that way or yeah um i think it's not necessarily it we just kind of did it in the marvin gay thing Mm -hmm. but let me break it down more than you know what a guided meditation would be at like a retreat or something like that what it's really about is removing tempo from the situation in the oh, beginning. Okay. So that, um, cause we kind of sped through that whole Marvin Gaye thing. Right. Like I, even me at my level, I would have done that at a fraction of the speed. Right. And so I would, I would have done is, you know, every note's going mm, yeah, yeah and that's for me that's the meditation like right kind of no not just glossing over stuff yeah so if i'm going here and i know that i want that to be my melody like what are the things that i can do between here and there not just go but more like yeah kind of like intentional exploration So it's really about going crazy slow mm-hmm. and and not rushing. And to me, that's what our musical meditations are. It's, right on. You know, and just uh, and I don't worry about tones at all. Like when I make my beats and stuff like that, I'm going with reasonable sounds. I'm not because if I get sucked into making the dopest bass song or like getting the perfect kick drum. It's like, I'll never get to the B section of the tune, you know? So really going slow and focus on music for music's sake. Right. It's kind of the big thing. Yeah. And I'm not a super fast keyboardist. Like I can, I play keyboard on all my songs, but I'm not sort of like performance level. Like I can get, I can't get from this chord to that chord to that chord in a concert setting for right. everything, you know? So I'll do that a lot here too, where I'll, you know, like I have to go slow. try to do that in guitar too even though I'm much faster at it but like yep. the, the, you know and then, and then okay now I'm gonna go my B this one goes here this one goes here this one goes here 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 yep, right. <laughs> yeah right mm-hmm. yeah and then I'll and then I'll kind of piece all that together. and while you were doing that were you thinking theoretically or are you just thinking <clears throat> about movement and and how you Both. what you're hearing is coming next Both. Uh huh. Um, it's kind of uh, they work in tandem, mm-hmm. you know. I think I think of theory as more like the fact checked after the the decision has been made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny how it usually works out. You're like, oh well, look at that. Very conventional, actually. You right. Know, so exactly. Yeah. Oh, that was really cool. <laughs> what was that? It was just G to D. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right on. Cool. So you um. Uh, I was actually pretty surprised to hear that you started as a, I don't know if you started as a classical guitarist, but you went to school for classical guitar. Uh-huh. Um, and I definitely did not start there, but I spent a lot of time there. Yeah. 
And then I, I read in an interview that you actually kind of made a, uh, you went through a, a phase of wanting to go straight acoustic. Uh -huh. And then now you've come the complete opposite oh, yeah, direction. Sure, right. uh, although I did read how you talk about mixing the organic with the electronic and it's kind of this coming together. Sure. But like, I know a lot of people, including myself, struggle with, I want to do everything. I want to just play the blues. I know I want to play jazz. No, I want to do this and I want to do that. And you think, and you can get handicapped in that way. Right. And you were talking about how it's natural to go through cycles and go through these phases and stuff. So right. how I feel like when I listen to what you do now, I feel like you're fully committed to a sound, right. at least as I've discovered you in the last sure, year. And here's where you are. I don't know anything else except what I've read there, right, but like right. how, how, how does that, how do you deal with the desire to like do something totally different and not be in a certain sound uh, and, and, and deal with that like having multiple interests and not knowing, not knowing what to sound what like or, what, or what direction to go through. Right. And how have you dealt with that? Yeah. I mean, I still deal with that. It's more, uh, it's more manageable these days, you know. Um, and I think that's my family. Um, I think, yeah, I said something. I have a lot of empathy for musicians it's because I used to be that kid that woke up and slammed a bunch of coffee and was like, "All right, I'm going to do an hour of mandolin. I'm going to do an hour of jazz guitar. Now I got to do my classical horn." Blah 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 blah. And then, like, I literally, like, my senior year at CU, I was playing in jazz band. I was playing mandolin in the orchestra pit for a Mozart, uh, for, for a Mozart opera. I was playing in pubs with a bluegrass band. I played like Oscar Blues and Lions every Sunday for free <laughs> pizza and beer, and it was awesome. Probably my favorite gig I had. I had like a funk jam band. I ended up auditioning and getting the gig for, to play guitar in a 12-piece Latin band. So like, I totally know that feel. And I think what happened is that a couple things, and I was playing in a Motown cover band at the same time. Nice. Like way too much shit, you know, just yeah. like way too much. And it was all good, um, but I think I, even I was even playing violin at one point. Wow. Because in my bluegrass band, I was playing second fiddle. And like I'd jump back and forth between mandolin and second fiddle, and then one day I was like, I'm just trying to do too much. I like I can practice 12 hours a day, and I just won't be truly great at anything, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think my my simple answer to you with that is that like really up it's up to the artist. Like do an assessment at what you like. Follow your gut as to what one you're naturally interested in and two what you're you naturally get momentum at and hopefully they're the same thing you know and if you want to learn like some say bluegrass mandolin it doesn't mean that you have to be david grisman or chris Teeley. it might mean that you learn just enough to do background part tremolo parts <laughs> for the bridge on your next beat mm -hmm. you know um so I think really though, like the simple answer is all that is cool, especially if you want to be a studio person. Like I actually now regret that I stopped playing violin. Mm -hmm. I wish I had just kept it and played 20 minutes a week so mm -hmm. that it never went away. Right. You know, and then I could do all my own string parts. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'm not dead yet though. So maybe I'll go. go right. back. Um, but really like focus on like what your true voice is. For mm -hmm. me, I found that it is like the neo soul R and B thing. Like mm -hmm. I love, I love like the rock and Jimi Hendrix stuff. I mm -hmm. love shoegaze music. I mm -hmm. just love those textures. I'm not gonna go start a shoegaze band though. Mm -hmm. Like I love Polyphia and Covet and all these progressive rock bands. But mm -hmm. I'm not even like occasionally like I'll lift like eight bars of their tab just to like a reality check of what my agility is, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to try to like play their songs all the way through or start that band in the same way that none of them would try to do what I'm doing, right? you know, to where they're trying to just make their own beats in a full record, Yeah, you know? So I think it's the, and the thing is when you find your lane, you find peace, 
you know, part of that fractured thing, I think is maybe a lack of peace in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Of like, maybe this will give me peace. Maybe this will give me peace. Maybe this will give me mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, when you put it all together, you're like, oh, it kind of didn't. But then you have, you know, then you see somebody like Joe Pass who would like, knew one thing yeah and played in restaurants and you can always hear the clinking glasses and probably <laughs> right. at the time of his life yeah you know just go <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah yeah so or you know my friends who play like bluegrass banjo like they don't aspire to be joe pass right. or joni mitchell or right. anything like that so it's it's really like experiment but follow your gut on what your lane is yeah because I've also had that with producing, you know, I was uh -huh. doing a lot of remixes because people were seeking me out and I had success. And then I was finally like, oh, I'm not focusing on my own voice. Mm. I'm slightly, I'm inserting a diluted version of myself inside somebody else's and I'm looking for their mm. approval. And that sucks. And it was like, a, I spent months and months of my life on remixes that never came out. I did one for, you probably know this, I did one for Sean Mendez a year and a half ago. Wow. They hit me up. <clears throat> I did four versions of remixes because I really wanted the gig because of how it would look, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I listened back to all of them. And none of them are really me. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. they're him with aspects of me hoping that he'll like, mm -hmm. you know? But yeah. I think as a result, they passed on it. Like if they did it now, I would probably do like, a lo-fi hip-hop thing right be like take it or leave it right <laughs> you know? yeah that's a good point that's a really good point yeah but that that whole um it's not me i think how do you know when something is you and how do you uh yeah i think that's the big dream of so many musicians is i i want to find my own voice right and i see so many amazing musicians just can never quite get there because they're just kind of have an ideal that's outside of themselves that right. they're trying to. So was there a point where you were like, is it a maturity thing? Is it? And then you see some people early on, like you and I were both at the Tom Mish concert. Right. There's a young man who's found his his voice and he's but he only 22 has one lane. years old. You know, he right? Has he has one lane. one lane. He found yeah. it real fast. Like he's not he's not going <laughs> right. right? Yeah. And he only had distortion on like one song. Like yeah. he really has his own lane. Yeah. You know, like he didn't play an Ibanez halfway through with a Floyd Rose. <laughs> right, right, like, right. You know? like he's yeah. very much, he's all about like post Dilla hip hop R and B. Yeah. Like that's right. his thing. Right. And he's never and he does he's not gonna be a studio guy. Like for other people. Yeah. You know, I mean maybe as like a famous guest, but not as a work for hire, like somebody like Bo Diakowitz is or something like mm -hmm. that, you know. Yeah. So I think crazy. Yeah, totally. But I think he's he's a great example of never tried to be anything that he wasn't. Right. We, we should all be so blessed. Yeah. You know, especially in the age of internet, because it's like you see John Mayer's is here. Give me some of that. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And then you see, and then Flume comes out, and it's like, oh, feature based. Give me some of that. Yeah. yeah. And then you see, you know, an amazing folk band where you can hear needle pin drop. And you're like, oh. I want that. Mm -hmm. That's actually what I want. You right. know? And then you, and then you see, a, I don't know, somebody with buckets. You're like, huh, maybe, maybe that's for me, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I mean, I think there's a, I think that's also like noticing the difference between inspiration and then um, like pure inspiration. I'm excited about this. And then like the distillation of inspiration, which is like the buckets were cool. I'm actually going to sample those for my next beat mm -hmm. behind this. Yeah, so it's almost taking that next step. So right. taking the step from inspiration to creation through the inspiration. Right, exactly. Yeah. One with the internet just exacerbates that whole mm. thing. It's like if we can finally turn off our notifications, then can we turn off the inspirations? Mm -hmm. and and make them distillations right you know I'm just like okay I, I loved flume snare drum but is it relevant to me right you know or is it just something that i have the freedom to enjoy yeah right, right, right. You know, which for fiery people like myself who's an aries born in a fire dragon year that was a very hard obstacle to overcome mm -hmm. i'm just like me it's okay to just be a fan you don't have to experience that art first person Mm -hmm. You don't have to create that. 
So it's an ongoing thing. But we're blessed in a world that we have all those opportunities. That that's even an issue, you know? Yeah. Totally. Because it's, you know, there's plenty of places in the world where they got, you know, a broken up guitar amp and two strings and they're it's, making it's, magic. It's like we're spoiled kings being fed grapes, you know? Right. It's like <laughs> they call it an embarrassment of riches. Is yeah. That that term? <laughs> totally. So recently you had... Uh, you released your new album on Spotify, Koi Pond, mm -hmm. and it's been getting a lot of traction. You have three million something streams like or something yeah. like that. And I didn't even know about this whole playlist opportunity. Right. Um, but that, the way you're using Instagram, the way you're doing things online, it seems like you, you're, you're leveraging a lot of opportunities that people might not understand. So you can, mm -hmm. can you talk about how that's working out and, and yeah I mean it's really the here's what you need to know about Spotify and playlisting um, it's the Wild West you know and what happened with me may not happen with anybody else mm -hmm. and vice versa right you know um, I put out my first album in print and it did okay, but it wasn't like anything crazy. Like I think the most popular tune has like 15,000 plays right now. Um, but then I ended up doing more of like the chill R&B, you know, instrumental hip hop stuff, which I, I'm actually naturally better at. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and through a friend of a friend, I got introduced to the chill hop label and it just so happened that they really liked the two demos that I sent that went from one person to another person. And it, it, like I had written it off. I thought it wasn't happening. And mm -hmm. then one day I woke up to a message of like, hey, we love your stuff. My whole point, though, with, to answer your question is that, um, you know, like I released the album in July and I didn't get any official playlists until September. Um, but the Chill Hop music label community brand has such a strong following unto themselves they really are an amazing success story and that they don't need others like they they have a great mailing list they have great online engagement like they don't need to hit up billboard or nest hq or rolling stone because they have as much of a reach as all those other people so they can literally just put it out to their fan base and their fan base is very loyal and trusting because they're good at like they're not going to put out a metal record mm -hmm. right so um but what happened was i think through and i did some collaborations with other artists that are on their label that are much further along mm -hmm. that i was able to get noticed um but really like the playlisting thing is think of it like there's a party that you're trying to get into. Mm. If you knock on the front door, nobody's going to answer. <laughs> if you sneak around the side into the bathroom and you get in, anybody will talk to you <laughs> because they think you're supposed to be there. Okay. And it's kind of that's a lot of the music industry is like that, uh -huh. you know. And it's like, don't tell anybody you weren't invited. You know, uh, that <laughs> is a great analogy. Wow. And so, and then you get there, and people assume you're supposed to be there, and so they're like, hey, here you go, you're part of the party. I'm going to call <laughs> you for gigs. You know, nice. Um, and so it really was just one thing led to another, you know, and we were talking earlier, it doesn't mean that I'm golden for the rest of my life. You know, it's like, you're only as good as your, your next thing you put out. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that everything in the future that I put out will get playlisted. Right. Um, yes, there, and I've talked with some people about this, like, yes, there may be some nepotism involved or if you you have a reputation, but really with the playlisting thing, they also go by like behind the scenes stats. Mm -hmm. So if you have a track in a playlist and somebody does you a favor and it continually gets skipped, you know, mm -hmm. you're out. You can't hide from those algorithms. You can't hide from the algorithms. Yeah. Um, so it's an amazing thing, but honestly, I see it as only one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have an incredible amount of gratitude for it happening. Um, but if Spotify were to blow up tomorrow, mm -hmm. I would still have a music career mm -hmm. because of all these other things, right? you know? And and even like, you know, it's it's harder to fake than SoundCloud was because things with SoundCloud, like you can buy 
you can pay for big accounts to repost you. So then all of a sudden you have a track with 50,000 plays and nobody knows who you are. Mm. And that's, sure, that's great. But that was also led to like the kind of demise of SoundCloud is because you could buy success. I didn't even know that. Okay. Yeah, so which is, in most industries when you can buy success, that's the beginning of the end. Right? Absolutely. Because then it's, the quality control just plummets. Yes, right? I, I see venues on that. And even these yeah. like curated Instagram pages pay for a feature. Like yeah, yeah. I don't pay attention because I know chances are it's just that somebody whereas like pickup, you know, he features really good music. So right. I know he I should listen. Take your money. Right. Or like Rockwood Music Hall in New York. I know if yes. I go there, I'm going to see a good show because exactly. they're, they're only going to. Exactly. Go and like, quality. yeah. So Sam's a great example. Um, Sam Blakelock, who runs pickup. One of my favorite things about it is he never features himself on that. Right. You know, he could so easily be like, I'm using my platform of 400,000 people to yeah. premiere my new single. Right. But he doesn't do that. Right. I think that's amazing. Yeah, it's really like, cool. That's like such a small percentage of humanity would do that. Yeah. You know? It says a lot about his character. It says a lot sure. about your character. And yeah. even like when I, um, when he's featured me, like I've thanked him. And he's never even said you're welcome because I don't even think he thinks of it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just more like you, you know, it was good. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's a good point. So we've got a few minutes left. It would be awesome if you could show us maybe based on that idea you had, like yeah, yeah. how you would workshop um, then, your yeah. idea into your kind of musical environment. 100%. Cool. All right. So I've got three tracks open. Um, I got a guitar and a beat and some chords. So here's what I'm gonna do. One, two, three, four. All right, so there's my. Even let's just say, for example, I was in the mood to overdub some guitar, so Right there. All right, right. Yeah. and then it'd be really as simple as like, you know, um, I would throw this into arrangement, and then I would just get it out to like thirty seconds, and then I would just do, you know, a little render, throw it, and uh, as you've seen it from my past Instagram stories, I have folders depending on yes, what the style. Yes. That is, right? uh, yeah. So I would do like. Just just call it Marvin Gaye or something, mm -hmm. and then, you know, say I have to run off to a lesson or something like that. Like right now. <laughs> right, right, right now. <laughs> but, and then like tomorrow when I go in here, Marvin Gaye's there. 
So in other words, organization matters. Organization, yeah, it helps greatly. Yes. You know? And then I might just throw this in a loop. busy like crazy. Yeah. Cool. Cool, man. And that's like, that's kind of a nutshell of what I do. Awesome. So, Thank you. Right. So if people want to check out your music, where should they go? <clears throat> just look up Cloudcore anywhere. Awesome. Spotify and all the socials, you know, just at Cloudcore. So thank you, sir. My pleasure, Gary. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching this interview with Derek Van Scoten, a.k.a. Cloudcord. If you would like to support POW Music, these interviews, the lessons, all this free content on the channel, please go to patreon.com slash POW Music and consider supporting the channel for as little as $1 a month where you will receive exclusive rewards such as transcriptions of these interviews, tab and supporting resources for all my lessons, and weekly live face-to-face -face video lessons as well. So please go there, support in any way that you can. I appreciate it, and I'll see you guys in the next lesson, next interview. Take care, happy playing, bye-bye.